Welcome to Temple Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us for the first time. We're glad to have you. Howdy. Make yourself at home. Hope you feel like that. Uh, I guess Brother Lawson is going to stay home today. I don't know for sure. I know that the doctor told him to go rest. I read a, a message uh, that somebody had put on the, 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 uh, the email that the church sends out that almost made it sound like the doctor sent him home to die, but that wasn't the case. I was in the room with him when the cardiologist told him that he's going to let him go home to rest, not to die, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, but, but I think they're supposed to do the procedure tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, and hopefully they'll be able to rectify the situation uh, and uh, we'll have him back in the pulpit by next weekend if, we, if the Lord blesses, and uh, I trust that he will. We've got Brother Sonny here. He's going to preach for us, right? That's right. He's going to preach, Sonny Dix. And uh, the preacher asked me to bring a Sunday school lesson this morning, so I'm going to try to uh, with the help of the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name now, we approach you, Lord. We ask for your presence in this meeting. Father, I pray and ask that you'd anoint me, Lord, that I might teach your word. Lord God, that you minister to the hearts of thy people, Father. Lord, just take this little simple message that I have and, and make application to those and help it to, to meet the needs of, uh, of the people that are here, Lord. Father Jesus said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And Lord, we're hungry, we're thirsty. Won't you fill us today? In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. And starting in verse number 9, the Lord Jesus has uh, been instructing the disciples. They ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. And he gives them a model prayer that they can pray. Of course, you know, we know this isn't the Lord's prayer. His prayer is over in the book of John, but it's a model prayer that we can pray and down in verse number 9, he, uh, he tells them something very important that they should ask for and, and a very critical uh, truth about prayer. He said, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And my lesson today <coughs> would be on the Holy Spirit and asking God to fill us with his Spirit. Of the many things that go on in churches nowadays in, in, in these days of apostasy that we're seeing around us uh, it's very evident that God's not within a hundred miles of most of what's happening they got everything in the world I, uh, there's a church out in Concord uh, that uh, I saw a video of on the internet the other day and 
they were, it's a Baptist church, supposedly fundamental, and they were having a rock concert in the church. The kids running, jumping around, and, and the song could have very well been a crossover song that you would have seen anywhere. And I thought, where is God in that? There are churches that this morning will have dance troops up on the stage, going around, flinging their ribbons in the air and, and all of that. And, and they'll do comedy skits and little mini dramas and plays. And I, I, I have to ask myself, where is God in all of that? But you see, today, The church is in such a state, it's so bereft of the power of God that man has to resort to the techniques and the methods that the world uses in order to bring in members. The fellowship hall has become the family life center. It's, it's, it can be disheartening. But then again, it can encourage us because we know that when we see all these things come to pass, that it's time to lift up our eyes for our redemption draweth nigh. But, but the thing that, that I want to speak about this morning is, is our great need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Now, I don't know about you, but during the day, uh, as I go through my life and, and I have to, to deal with things in a secular manner, of course, you know what I'm saying. I mean, get out and work and rub elbows in the marketplace and, and things of that nature. Uh, often little things will, will slip out if I have not started my day in a certain way that, that, uh, that, that really shouldn't ought to be there. If I don't get up and ask the Lord every morning to fill me with the Holy Spirit and, and to give me a sense of His presence throughout the day, it makes a real difference in the way my day goes. And as I lie in my bed at night and look back over the day, I'll, I'll see places where these lips that are made to praise God utter profane things where this mind that should meditate on the Word of God wasn't thinking about such holy stuff. And, and it, it's, it's, that, it's that dual nature of man that makes it so imperative that, that we be filled with the Spirit every day. Now, in a lot of churches... And among many groups of Christians that I know, one of the greatest oddities that, that they see is a spirit-filled Christian. They get uncomfortable around them. I remember when when uh, when preacher was had his experience with God up here on the back porch, and and I mean there was nothing charismatic about it or anything of that nature. It was simply a, a God came down and. And filled Pastor Lawson with himself, with an overwhelming awareness of the love and the glory of God. And it's transformed his ministry. And, uh, but there were people, members of this church, people that I had fellowship with for years, who were offended at that. And they couldn't stay in his presence. It made them uncomfortable. Because we get used to doing things in a certain way. Okay, we have the Christmas play. We have the Easter pageant. We, uh, uh, a couple of times a year, maybe, we'll call revival meetings, which really amount to not much more than a lot of special singing and a guest preacher showing up little emotional release and then they go right back to living the way that they were but that's not the way that God intended for us as children of God to live most of us are content to merely be sealed 
by the Spirit of God. And we are. If you're a child of God, you are sealed into the day of redemption. But, but brother, ha have you ever come to the place, sister, where you think there must be more to it than this? There's got to be more to it than this. Well, there is. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. You see, it's probably the most overlooked need of the church today is being filled by the Holy Spirit of God. We have men in pulpits who know all the doctrines. They, they know all about God, but they don't really know God. And it, it, everything they do is an intellectual endeavor. And because of this, they're not able to teach their people how to get a hold of God. And I think that that's the primary function of the under-shepherd in the church, of the pastor, is to teach the people how to know their God, how to know him. I preached a message last Sunday night about that I may know him and how essential it is. And, and, and it's with that thought in mind that, that I enter into this lesson this morning. You see, knowing him is something that is commanded of us by the word of God. Not only should it be our desire, but, 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 but we ought to know God. We should know him. In Ephesians 5, 14 through 21, it says, Wherefore he, God saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. I'm sure if you're born again, I, I believe that I can guarantee that at least in the beginning of your Christian life that that was the life that you lived. Do you remember days when you would wake up and the first thought in your mind would be something like the bliss, oh, the bliss of the glorious thought. My sins not in part, but the whole are nailed to the cross and I bear them no more. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord. I mean, brother, this, is, this isn't just put in here to to be pretty poetic language. This is a reality that we can live. And it's the reality that the early church did live, by and large. They lived this thing in the book of Acts. And we're in a perfect season right now for this to happen in Temple Baptist Church. In the book of Acts, in chapter number 4, it talks about how that Peter and, and John were were uh, uh, walking along and, and they had, or they had healed this man at the temple and, and they took and, and they uh, stood him up before the, 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 the high priest, the, the, the rulers, the Pharisees, religious leaders, and they commanded them not to speak in the name of Jesus. They couldn't deny the miracle. So they just told them, well, shut up, and they threatened them. Well, they were in a time of crisis right then. And they went back and they reported to the church what had taken place. And then they began to, to fall on their face and lament to God about what was happening, how, how, that, how that they were being oppressed and how that they were standing against God himself, the leaders of the people were. But how that God was still stretching forth his hand and doing miracles and, and bearing witness to the truth of the words that they were speaking. And it said that after 
that, that, that when they had prayed, after they had prayed, that the place they were in was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart. And we're in a crisis in our church right now. I know that you can sense it. Poor brother David Presley, when he got up to preach the other night, it was like he was in a, a tomb. Man, I mean, it was, it, we were just subdued. We were subdued. It's almost like Satan himself is hovering over the church going, hmm, I'm about to wipe this one out. No, he's not. <laughs> no, he's not. And even though Brother Presley may not realize it, he gave a good message the other night. He talked about examining yourself, checking your spiritual temperature, as it were, seeing where you're at with God. You see, we've got to learn as Christians to, to, to spend more time thinking about God's promises in our possessions. To, to find that it's more important for us to do right, according to this book, than to be right, according to our own devices. Every man's way is right in his own heart, you know. I mean, we can justify anything. And the only way that we can do this, that our behavior can be tempered, is to be filled with the Spirit of God. And as I said here, it's, a, it's, a, it's an imperative here says for us to be filled with the Spirit. It's not a suggestion. It's not optional. If you're going to live a fruitful, joy-filled, peace-filled Christian life, you must be filled with the Spirit of God. I, as I said, I, I preached a message on that I may know Him. Well, the key to knowing God is being filled with the Spirit. I mean, to really know Him. Because, you see... When, when we read, we perceive with our minds. But if we're not filled up with the Spirit of God, everything gets filtered through here. And it's our fleshly minds that are grasping things. And we find ourselves pretty soon in the position that the Jews were in, that, that Paul spoke of in Romans, where we're either excusing or accusing one another, and we're finding ways out of the things that God's Word reveals to us. We justify ourselves. But, brother, when you're filled with the Spirit, the matter reaches way beyond here. It gets you down in the inward parts where that God can fix you. And believe me, we all need fixing. Amen. 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 We all need fixing. Yes, Jesus said in John 14, 15 through 21, He said, if you love me, do you love him? If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Now, listen to this next verse. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I will come to you. First John 5, 7. The Father and the Word. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. In Acts chapter number 5, what did it say? He said, when, when, when uh, Ananias and Sapphira uh, committed their sin, why hast thou conceived in their heart to lie unto the Holy Ghost? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. They like, everybody likes to say God, the Holy, or, uh, or uh, the Holy Ghost is God. Yes, He is. Well, God's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I mean, there's one God. There's one God. There's one God. And and this, what I love, what is it, in Second Corinthians three and thirteen says? Now the Lord is that Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. There's liberty. If you love Jesus, then, then we of necessity must love his spirit. And if we want to have fellowship with him, then we have to be filled with the spirit of God. 
He said, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. And at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Now listen, you can, you can I, I've got a book by Spurgeon on, uh, uh, on Jesus Christ. Uh, I've seen Edersheim's book on the Messiah, and you can read those books and memorize them, and you won't know Jesus. You know about him, but you won't know him. The only way you can know him is in here. It's what he revealed, he, he manifests himself to you. And that's a reality that nobody can take away once that happens. Now, a lot of us, and I don't know about you, but I got plenty of thoughts. And, and I need some help in my daily life. Uh, and the key to victorious living is being filled with the Spirit of God. What did Paul say in Romans 8, 1? There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The modernists like to stop right there. Okay, you've come down. You've made your profession of faith. You've signed the card. You've been through the baptismal pool. You're in Christ. There is no condemnation for you. But they got to play Jehudi to do that. Because it goes on to say, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Brother, if you are sure enough born again child of God and you can go to honky tonks and cheat on your wife or ladies you lay around watching soap operas all day and fantasizing about uh, committing adultery and stuff like that and you got no conviction it ain't because you're in Christ right. it's because you got a seared conscience that's what it is that's what it is. It, it, the the, the, the uh, thought that there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit, is the promise to those who know him, to those who love him, to those who are filled and led by the Holy Ghost of God. And I just wonder how many of us this morning when we woke up when you pray before you come to church, say, oh, God, please fill me with your spirit today. I want you to shine forth through me. I, want, I don't want people to know that, that I'm a Christian because of some overt act that I do. I want them to be able to sense it just by my demeanor, by a difference about me. And I'm telling you, God can make that difference in our lives. He can absolutely do it. We, as individuals, each and every one of you who are a born-again child of God can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And I'm not... Here's the thing. This thing over the past 50 years has been so corrupted by men like Branham and Caps and all these uh, charismatic, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it guys that most fundamentalists are scared to death of the Holy Spirit of God. And when we do that, we forsake any power that God would have in our lives. And therefore, we have to do everything through the power of the flesh. Well, that's just wood, hay, and stubble. Amen. It's going to burn up. We need to be filled with it. Don't worry about what the charlatans are doing. Worry about what God can do for you. We need to be filled with the Spirit. He said, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Where does sin derive its power from? From the law. And brother, if you're walking free of the law, then the thing that empowers sin and, and gives it uh, the strength to bind you is broken. It's broken. 
We are not slaves to sin anymore. It takes some of us longer to realize this and to walk in it than it ought to. But it's the fact. As a child of God, you're as free today as you will ever be from sin. You ain't going to get any more saved when you get to heaven. You are complete in Him. You're complete. And the thing is, not for us to to try to accomplish this by doing, it's by being what you are as a child of God and resting in God's promises. So for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. There is power for victorious living in a Spirit-filled life. And if you want to honor God in your life, there's only one way to do it. Listen, you you could have it. You could sing like an angel, and get up and sing stuff, and and uh, or or you could you could preach. And man, I mean, there's some people who can preach, you know, but they just dead inside as they can be. There's no power in it. You go to school, study homiletics, learn sermon structure, and whatever else, you know, get you some of those books with a thousand and one illustrations, so you can tell. Uh, interesting anecdotes during the message to really get the people on your side and all that and uh, be just popular as can be and dead as a doornail in everything that you do but the key to a God honoring life is being filled with the spirit of God and if you're filled with that see it's a reciprocal thing it's a, there's a back and forth in a relationship you realize that of course uh, you got a friend uh, maybe you if you go and talk to somebody and they just stand <laughs> and stare off into space, that's not much of a relationship, is it? If you got a husband or a wife and you never spend any time conversing with each other, that's not much of a relationship. And if 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 we are only telling God, well, God, I want this, I need this, give me this, do this, do that, and he's not speaking to us, then there's no real relationship. We're trying to turn God into some kind of a cosmic bellhop to satisfy our wandering desires, and that's not what God is. See, he wants an intimate relationship with us. Well, Jesus said, me and I and my father, we will come to you, is, is what he said. We'll come. He said, I'll come. We'll come. And we'll dwell within you. He wasn't whistling Dixie, man. That's real. That's real. And it, in John chapter 15, it, 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 verse 4 through 8, he says this. He said, abide in me. Live there. Remember Brother Dave Paget's message on on uh, uh, making uh, the throne room your living room. Man, what a powerful message that was. He's talking about abiding in the presence of God. Well, you see, as I said, it's a reciprocal thing. When you abide in God, when that's, your, when that's where you're at and your awareness is, is of God, then you can count on this. He's abiding in you. He's here. He's in, he promised you he would be there. Jesus, in Revelation, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. Man, I mean, he, he wants that with you. He, he desires that with you. And there's no reason in the world for you not to have that. None whatsoever. But he said, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine no more can ye 
except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. That's the only way to be a fruitful Christian, to glorify God is by that abiding relationship. And that comes from being filled with the Spirit of God. That's what it means for him to abide, for him to fill you. I mean, every one of you got him in you. He's in, he's in you. But are you filled? Are you filled? Now, if you're like me, most of the time I, I, I pray for God to fill me. And uh, I find that on days like today or like last Sunday when, when, uh, when I need to do something for the Lord, boy, I really want him to fill me. I mean, bad, because I'm in a complete state of panic. I, if you made a mess of things as much as I have, <laughs> you know you can't do it. You know, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm very aware of what I am. I'm very aware of that. But the desire of my heart is to, to, uh, to have that sense of need of God all the time. All the time. Because we do. We do. It's not just for the big things. We need it for the little things. We need it for when, when we're dealing with our children. We need to be full of the Spirit of God. When we're, when we're dealing with, with, with uh, relatives and friends, we need to be full of the Spirit of God. Let your speech always be seasoned with grace. See? And, and, uh, and we just, this, 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 I know that it's there and the possibility's there and, 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 the, and the, the propensity to it is, is in our DNA for us to drift in and out, to be off and on, up and down. But it doesn't have to be like that. I believe that there's a place that we can get to where, where that we are really what God wants us to be. I, I honestly do. I don't think that we're helpless. I don't think that we're uh, without hope. I don't think that, that all that we can do is just kind of sit there stoically and let life happen to us. I believe that God has made it possible for us to live in him and, and be so filled with him that we live the life that's promised to us in Scripture. Now, Jesus said, I give them to, I, I, he said, I give them life, uh, abundant life. He said, I mean, I'm talking about, man, your, your cup just, just flowing over. And I think about that stuff. Now, most of us, we get a little bit of persecution and we just go all to pieces. She's not here now, so I'm, we got a young lady here who's going to Haiti on the mission field. And uh, the, the people she goes, I mean, she's young. She's 15, 16 years old. And uh, the, her friends at school are tormenting her and persecuting her over that. She was in tears over it, upset. She can't understand why they why they're doing this to her. And she loves the Lord, and she's going to go. She's going to go, and she doesn't understand why it's like that. And that, I've got to say, is the, the biggest example of persecution that I've seen here. But you know what? God will give her more grace. And I told her that when she gets down there, that the blessings that God will pour out on her for her obedience to him will far surpass the pain that she's experiencing right now because her friends are forsaking her. But I, I, I look at, 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 like, I spend a lot of time, you know, I preach on YouTube and, and you've got kind of an online ministry going there and, 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 and the, the thing uh, with, the, with the church page 
on uh, Facebook and, and stuff, and I hear a lot of stuff from a lot of people. I see a lot of videos, and it seems like one of the prevailing attitudes among professing Christians today in this nation is, is one of absolute re rebellion against all authority and, uh, and a willingness to, to take up arms and go to war. They, so there are people who can't wait for things to fall apart so they can start shooting folks. I'm serious. I, they make videos about I mean, they just just like, you know, God guns and apple pie, brother. I mean, they're there. That's them. That's them. And it's easy to get sucked into that thing, well, us against them. But, brother, you've got to take on the um, post-millennial view of the world for that to happen. First of all, we ain't going to be here Amen. when it's like that. We're going to be gone. Oh, we might suffer some persecution. As a matter of fact, people are being persecuted right now. Right now in this world beyond anything that you could believe. I've got here on a website called uh, somalisforjesus.blogspot. A year and a half ago, I was looking at Christian martyrs. And I found... Uh, a video of this man. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this is an example of somebody who was filled with the Spirit of God. His name was Mansur Muhammad. He's 25 years old. He got saved in 2005. And he's from Somalia. He was working with a relief foundation over there. And... Uh, he was on a truck, and they were delivering food to the outlying villages. You know, of course, in Somalia, with the way it is there, the rebels are going in and taking all the food and this and that and the other. Well, they're going around and passing out Bibles, telling people about Jesus, and giving them food. And uh, the rebels set up an ambush, and they captured him. And they posted a video. And the video, there were about a dozen of them standing around him. And uh, this one guy, he's reading from the Quran. And then they all prayed. And then they sang. And while all this is going on, a man's on each side of Mansur holding his arms. And there was uh, another man in front of him taking the blade of his knife and running it over his hair like this. Then after they had sang, this guy pulled out a sheet of paper and he unfolded it and read the accusation. And they took that brother in Christ, kicked him in the small of the back down on his stomach. And the guy who was messing with his hair jumped on his back, put his knee between his shoulder blades, reached around and proceeded to take his head. When he was finished, he took his head and he set it between his shoulder blades up on his back. And they're all praising, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. And uh, the thing that struck me most of that, I mean, first I was outraged by the inhumanity of it, by the viciousness, the, the demonic violence that they that they did to this man but the thing that really struck me was that was the first time in my life that I, I believe I've ever seen somebody who was truly filled filled to the brim with the spirit of God because when he stood there during the course of all that he did not say a word he didn't groan. He didn't complain. He did not beg. He did not struggle. It reminded me of Romans 8. Paul talked about all the day long are we killed for thy sake. He's like his Lord. Like his Lord as a sheep is dumb before his shearers he opened not his mouth. And I know that before the blood quit pumping out of his lifeless body, 
that he was received into the presence of our Savior. Amen. And when I think about that man, and I think about what, how God enabled him, oh Lord, how would you feel? God enabled him through the power of the Holy Spirit to stand there and just simply die for the name of Christ. I know that, that the same thing that God did for the first century church, he's still doing for the church today. Amen. And I want that. Amen. Above all things, I want to know him. I want to be filled with his spirit. I want to be filled with all the peaceful fruits of righteousness. And you know why? There was a time when I wanted all of that because of my aspirations. Oh, I aspired to many things. I did. I was going to be this. I was going to be that. I was going to make a name for myself. Everybody would know me. But I find that the more I know him, the less that I desire to be known. I finally learn, I'm learning what it is to do as Paul said in Philippians 2, to let each esteem other better than himself, in honor preferring others, and, uh, and, and not feeling that, that, why didn't they pick me? I'm so much better. I'm more quiet. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, that, 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 that old fleshly desire to be seen. And a lot of you have known me for a long time, and I've got to tell you, a lot of the preaching and stuff that I did years ago, I did with just that attitude. And, and I, I'm so ashamed of myself for ever having been like that. And most of you know my story, so let me tell you, don't make God have to take you down the path that he's taken me to teach me the things that I've learned. Because if you're his, he's surely going to teach you. He most certainly will. See, he wants to bring something forth in your life. And now, let's talk about the benefits of being filled with the Spirit, shall we? We see them listed over in Galatians 5, 22 through 26, where it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. The fruits of the Spirit. I will break them up into three sections. There's love and joy and peace. Those are inward. Those are in you. Jesus said, by this shall all men know you, my disciples, that you love one another. How, how, how appropriate that, that, that he listed love is among the first of the fruit of the Spirit. Because its preeminence is made evident in 1 Corinthians 13. It's the greatest. It's better than prophecy. It's better than faith. It's better than all other things is that charity, that love, that love. John said, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And our love for each other ought to be more than, oh, I love you, brother. And they go on and go. Rawr, 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 rawr. Love doesn't keep count of the wrongs that people have done to us. Right. Amen. Amen. Love doesn't want to be seen. It vaunteth not itself. 
and, and, and joy, the peace that, that he gives, the joy, joy. I mean, brother, you got to be filled with the Spirit to walk in joy. But most of us are content simply to, to get a good laugh every now. <laughs> oh, I'm happy now. Now I'm sad. That ain't what joy is. Joy sustains you in the darkest of hours. Joy doesn't go away, man. I mean, it's there in peace. Jesus said, peace, I leave you. My peace I give unto you. Have you got peace? I mean, really, in your life? Or is your life just torn up? Is it in turmoil? Is there always something going on that just is nagging at you and, and, and pulling at you and, and, and stripping away your peace and your joy and making you do things that you don't do in love? Well, brother, you ain't walking in the Spirit. You're not filled with the Spirit of God if that's the case. Now, the next three, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness, those are outward. See, those are the things that we express towards those that we uh, have contact with. I mean, there are a lot of people. It's easy to get aggravated with people and, and be put off by them, say, just write them off. But that's not the fruit of the Spirit. That's not a result of being filled with the Spirit of God. It's long-suffering. How long did God put up with you? <laughs> well, that's what he wants you to do. Mm -mm -mm. But you just don't understand how, how they hurt me. They made me mad. They let me down. They did this. They did that. They did the other. Well, Jesus said, well, uh, I say to you not, not seven times, but seven times seventy. If you love me, keep my commandments. You want to be filled with the Holy Ghost? There's a price. There's a price to pay. Long-suffering, gentleness. Let your speech always be seasoned with grace. Even when somebody's wrong, man, don't attack them. Go to them to help them. Whatever you do, let them know your motivation is love and, and that you're seeking their good. Not to beat them down. Goodness. Oh my gosh. Would you like people just to say, well, he's a good man. He's a good Christian. He's a good friend. He's a good brother, a good dad, a good uh, husband. Wouldn't you like for him to be able to say that about you? Well, be filled with the Spirit. And the last three. Faith, meekness, and temperance. Those are God words. Those are things towards God, faith in God, faith in the promises of God's Word. They come from being filled with the Spirit. Meekness. Meekness is not weakness. It's like Moses, the Bible speaks of Moses, the guy, he slew an Egyptian, buried him in the sand, ran off, God sent him back. Called plagues and curses down on all of Egypt, brought the greatest leader in the world to his knees and made him bend to the will of God. Went out, lifted up his staff, parted the Red Sea, <laughs> struck a rock, and water came out of it. I mean, brother, he was not a weak man. He was meek, though. You know what that is? It's a it's a quiet dependence and trust in God. That's why Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. And the one thing that he did when he was out of that meek attitude was strike that rock a second time. That was in the flesh, and it cost him. And whatever we do in the flesh will cost us. It certainly will. And then there's uh, the temperance. And that, that is, is living circumspectly before God. Walking in the fear of the Lord. Brother, there's a great shortage of the fear of God in this country today. How many men don't fear God? And in most churches, he's not feared. He's just your buddy. He's, God's desperate for you to get saved. No, he's not. No, he's not. So, as I challenged you last Sunday to... Join me in, in seeking to know him. I'll ask you now, those of you who want revival, 
See, revival's not going to come in in the back of somebody's car or something like that. It's going to start between you and God, wherever you are. Start praying and asking God to fill you with his spirit. Start looking for his presence in your daily life. And you know what? You'll find him. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray now that you'd help us receive instruction from the word. Lord God, help us to walk in the Spirit, Lord, to be filled with the Holy Ghost, that our lives might be pleasing unto Thee. I know we're saved. I know our sins are gone. I know that we're going to heaven. But, Lord, while we're here, let us be pleasing unto Thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.